All right, you wild-eyed bastages. How y'all doing out there? We got a wild episode for you today. And I'd say it exists somewhere between herding cats and trying to have a simultaneous discussion with five people who escaped from the funny farm. And that's about where this little episode lies right here. The subject, of course, would be the one and only Mike Dillon, legendary percussionist, awesome character, wild man, been in many great bands that I've been a fan of over the years. And it was awesome to sit down and catch up with him, albeit a whirlwind conversation and or rant. And uh, as a slight segue, one of the questions I did not get to ask Mike due to the time constraints was about the recently departed New Orleans piano genius and incredible photographer, despite being blind, Henry Butler. Uh, I saw Henry sit in on a show in New Orleans that Mike's band Critters Buggin opened for in Modesky, Martin & Wood. Uh, I believe it was the Sanger Theater. Uh, it was probably about 16, 17 years ago, something like that. And uh, Henry Butler sat in with Modesky, Martin & Wood that night, who on that particular night was never better and likely due in part, in my humble opinion, to the jaw-dropping show that Critters Buggin put on prior to them. But in any case, Henry sat in with them and played what might have been the most amazing solo I've ever heard or seen on any instrument, any genre. It was just absolute pure D genius. It was absolutely incredible. Felt like I was floating out in space. It was unreal. So rest in peace, Henry Butler. You were one of the baddest ever. And hopefully the next time I catch up with Mike for part two of this, maybe we'll have a talk about that show when we pick this interview up again. And as this is a short episode, uh, and assuming you have a long commute, feel free to play any of the other 95 episodes that uh, you can find on the Crash Bang Boom podcast for your track. We're approaching 100. Holy shit, it's been a long trip to say the least. But in any case, Mike and I get into tablas and monks in the Himalayas and festivals to blow your load and critters bugging, Matt Chamberlain and... Brian Haas and the one and only Johnny Vodakovich of Nola Tet that Mike Dillon also plays in make it a little appearance. Uh, we talk about jazz fest shows and the patented Mike Dillon pull and tuck method. So feel free to check that crazy shit out. Be on the lookout for Mike Dillon coming to a town near you. Uh, he will be on tour the rest of July and into August of 2018. And you can catch those dates on his website at, at MikeDillonVibes.com, which will be included in the description as well as other Mike Dillon related info. Shout out to my sponsor, New Orleans Record Press. If you, your band, or whatever project you're looking to put out is considering releasing vinyl, go on over to NewOrleansRecordPress.com for color, design, and mastering options as well as real time quotes. Give them a holler. Tell them Jody Smith and the Crash Bang Boom podcast sent you. You know, vinyl sounds killer, it just sounds better. Print that shit already. All right, here we go. A short and sweet, chaotic rant involving Mike Dillon, myself, and a couple of other crazy cats. Enjoy it, folks. Here we go. Crash Bang Boom. Crowds go mad with joy. Yep, yep. All right, Mike Dillon, I've been chasing you around all corners of the earth. We went to Iceland uh, for a second in a, one of those uh, spirit realms. Yes, nice. And, yeah, and uh, and then for a second to, uh, what's a more remote place than Iceland? Uh, yes, I remember that time we ended up in uh, a temple up in the yeah. Himalayas. Yeah, in the fucking Himalayas. Listening man. to those crazy guys chant. Yeah, it was a lot of chanting. And I, I was, I had my tabla with me. You did, and I was like, "God damn, I'm so glad he brought that tabla." I brought the tabla with me, and they let us stay there with him for like a couple of weeks. It was all due to the tabla. tabla. Yes, indeed. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. Fuck, I'm so glad you brought that tabla. Yes. Yeah, I, I was feeling a little bit of uh, out of my realm, but you, you brought it all together. And then we ended up down in Morocco with the master musicians of Jajuka Bashir Atar let us stay there because I jammed with him with Critters Buggin. That's right. So like, and we sat there and we watched the festival of Blojelode. Um, <laughs> Blojelode. 
Yeah, it, it really is like <laughs> blues elude, but we uh, rednecks call it blues elude. <laughs> You know, it's okay because you're from Texas and I'm from your neighboring state I and know. we can get away with We're these fucking things. rednecks who can get away with shit. But I don't know how much longer, but we're still going to keep trying. We'll keep trying, man. Uh, so a very bizarre story. And first, let me give a, a, a late introduction. A late introduction. Uh, from from tablas to uh, timbales and glockenspiels. <laughs> On glockenspiels. On glockenspiels. To marimbas. Okay. Uh, from so all of the auxiliary percussion, even kawikas, quickas, that's right. Yeah, all the things. Uh, so let me tell you about the first time that I saw you playing live. I might have told you this uh, briefly in a in a previous meeting, but I went to go see Stinkin' Lizavetta, who I was seeing. Stinkin' Lizavetta, Philadelphia, rock and roll. I love those guys, dude. How crazy was it? I mean, I've I've talked to Cheshire the drummer, and I was joking with her that as like a band of gypsies from Philly who lived in a van that had a lofted area where they would put the instruments beneath that sleep above it, and they had not one but two pit bulls to guard their shit. Is in what I think was 1997, a sweet 21 years ago. It was 1997. Critters Buggin was on tour. That was the night. It was Stinking Lizabetta, the host record. Critters Buggin and that fucking awesome band, uh, Brown Hornet. That's right. Spelled W H O R E. Yeah. Brown that band was crazy Hornet. as They're the fuck. Fucking like the redneck Mr. Bungle <laughs> from Texas, man. How crazy was that, man? I had a CD that was a double CD and it was like double nickels on the dime, but like maybe a hundred songs on it. It was yeah. insanity. Yeah. Yeah. So I went there knowing them and Sting Elizabeth. I knew nothing about Critters Bug. Thinking Buggin. Feller's Union Local. That other band. That was Thinking band. Feller's Union. Yeah, That's a great name. Yeah. I, I might just call my next band that because I don't know that they really trademarked that one. Nope. Nope. Uh, so needless to say, I saw all those bands. I thought, my God, this is totally insane. I knew nothing about Critters Buggin', nothing about Matt Chamberlain in particular. And as a drummer, having seen that for the first time, I was not ready for that onslaught. That was, uh, my God, dude. Matt is a fucking deep fucking musical illuminati he's a fucking secret chief of drumming because he really is a lot of folks don't know who he is unless you're like i don't know happen how. to read liner notes which no one does anymore right. but he plays like on everybody's, everybody's record if josh freeze isn't doing it and he's on the road all the time right matt's in la just recording all the time yeah yeah you didn't hear me say that josh i never met you but i know you're another musical illuminati but you're yeah. playing with sting and the vandals right. and devo and yeah Fucking rock in the free world. Absolutely. Matt, Matt Chamberlain. Matt is a bad motherfucker. I went to college with him. There so it when is. when they kicked the percussionist out of, uh, not not kicked, he's another good friend of mine, John Bush from the New Bohemians, <laughs> quit the band. I get a call from Matt like, hey, man, I'm living in Seattle. I knew he lived in Seattle. He's like, I'm playing with this sax player in Hauser. The sax player's name is Skerrick. Skerrick. He, he like smokes cocaine and, <laughs> and, and plays fucking sacks and he's out of his mind he was out of his mind back then i believe it i mean we were all doing tons of drugs back then not I, matt he was the Mr. music Chief. sounded like you did but i was just like whatever okay and he sent me a cd and i was in a band called billy go we were like punk funk and i thought they right i thought these guys suck via texas i was like critters bugging this sucks <laughs> i really did i thought it was horrible and the sax player really annoyed me really oh jesus i mean i hated it really yeah, I've never told anyone this. I, I mean, <laughs> I liked, like, I was into, like, fucking funk and punk. Not like what they call funk now, but, like, right. our version of funk was a bunch of dudes who couldn't really play funk. Right. But we like punk rock. That was, like, more like the Chili Peppers. And sure. Even, like, the big boys from Texas. Yeah, yeah. Minute Minute. You know, guys. Of course. That, punk guys that like funk, you yeah. know? Tim Kerr from the big boys started a band called Bad Mother Goose. We used to open for him. I mean, that was our school. We'd all go see George... Clinton playing thought it was awesome. Yeah. But we couldn't play like George Clinton. Like all the funk bands today, they study that shit and got right. it down. Right. You know. Uh, so anyway, but <laughs> then I went out and started rehearsing with him because I love Chamberlain. He's my homeboy. He went to college. That guy is fucking and, ridiculous. And I was had been on heroin for like fucking six years at that point. I was just kicking. How did you and feel? I your... had to learn how to play drums again with critters. That's I was, was about awesome. to say, yeah. How because weird. you know, I showed up there like on a plane. I was like, had been clean for sixty days, and I relapsed. And I get off the plane, I didn't have any drums or any clothes. Matt looked at me, he's like, "What the fuck happened to you?" And go to rehearsal with critters bugging and fucking scary. It's like, who the fuck is this asshole y'all invited out? And I was just like, "Uh, take me to an AA meeting. I need help." 
<laughs> so, um, and I somehow pulled it together. We it's rehearsed. a great, it's a great first impression, by the way. I, yeah. I can see we how we rehearsed they're... all week, and I started learning how to play drums again. And I had some drums sent out to me because I literally like disappeared, missed three gigs with Billy Goat, ended up somehow sleeping in the New Orleans airport, catching the plane, and meeting Skerrick, who literally that whole meeting changed my life because all of a sudden I was like, wait a second, because I just thought they were like a smooth jazz band with a good drummer, <laughs> and then I started hearing, I'm like, wait a second. Yeah, in hindsight, it might have saved it your life. It might have saved my life, and it was completely. Let's go and go with it. it, it and it I think saved it my did. life because, truthfully, whenever I play with those guys, I pull my shit together. Yeah, because they're bad, and then I started getting like, oh wow, they're writing music that's really different. Because truthfully, I was a jazz kid. Yeah. I just liked what I liked. I went to North Texas. That's yeah. how I knew Chamberlain. So that was in my vocabulary. But you know how like you go to jazz school and then you just yeah. go to rock and roll. And I saw the bad brains. I was like, right. fuck jazz. Yeah, the academia Fuck music school. Bullshit. I'm taking my clothes off, waving my dick around. Yeah. Fuck music school. But then when I started playing with Skerrick and those guys, that's when I came back to this side of music. just seen Thelonious Monk do his his movie and I was like in the hotel kicking dope I was like fuck fuck this shit I want to start playing jazz again so yeah. I got a vibraphone and literally for about a year I was practicing all the time again really to Monk yeah. to Monk Records Monk Records this, I was trying to get my shit together and I got the call to do that and it just sort of started this path back towards being a serious musician again but Whoa. in our school, we never take ourselves serious. Like nah. the Chamberlain, Skerrick school. Right. Like we can all play, but there's always humor. humor. Like even with Brian Haas, humor is important in our music. Do you feel like that's a Southern thing? No, I feel like that's an attitude thing with certain musicians. They want... I think it happens more so in the South because I've been in New York now for, for or well, the Northeast. New York, for... I mean, there's a lot of humor if you're hanging out with the right New York jazz musicians. Come on, Stephen Bernstein. I guess. Dude. Most of the jazz guys I run into, I'm like, yawn. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah, that's it. Turned me off. The academia of jazz turned well, me off. Well, it's called to the it. jazz arms race. I feel that. Yeah, that's, industrial arms race. The, the jazz, jazz industrial, industrial arms race. race. <laughs> all right, no, good believe enough. it, dude. I mean, I love it, man. I mean, I I think that's all important too. <laughs> yeah, it is. You can certainly learn from it, dude. I mean, all the old school jazz guys could play their asses off. They study. For sure. I believe in practicing all the time. Yeah. But they are also like we're coming just from a whole different socioeconomic background. It wasn't music school. It was like right. survival. Exactly. I.e. not academia, which gets ah. uh, becomes a slippery slope, I think. Yeah. So what else do you want to talk about, pal? You want to talk about my Jazz Fest schedule? Uh, I do actually want to talk about that. So correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, nine days, 20 shows. Did I get it right? 12 days, 27 shows. <laughs> All right, 12 it was days. absolutely... I mean, it's the kind of shit Johnny V used to do. Yeah. He only did like 18 shows this year. Oh, so you beat him. You one-upped him. He and, he and Stanton cut back this year. <laughs> <laughs> you had to make up for it. I understand. That is an, uh, that's a pretty impressive number, by the way. Uh, did you not feel slightly exhausted uh, at, the, at any point in that or at all times I felt. That? No, I, see, I drive so much. That, like People go, how do you play all those Jazz Fest gigs? I'm like... It's fucking easy. I'm in New Orleans. I'm not driving 1,400 miles and setting up with Nola Tet and playing a fucking gig. I mean, that's what I did the other day. I drove from Houston to Pittsburgh, meet these guys at the airport. We go set up in a fucking monsoon. I'm <laughs> loading down a basement, nearly fall down with a trap case. I'm going, who the fuck booked this fucking gig? Fuck these motherfuckers. I mean, that was the hard shit, not playing three gigs in one day in New Orleans. That's easy when you're playing with the best musicians on the planet, like Johnny or James. Right. And carrying, shit down. carrying the shit down. The, Johnny and I are like, who the fuck did this shit to us? Hey, look at him. We got Johnny Vodakovic over here himself. Look at him. Oh, he's got scars to prove it. Look at him. Oh, my God. Look at him. Hey, he's bruising scars. You look like you're shooting dope again, Johnny. Johnny, that looked suspect. Oh, 
Hey, it happens. It fucking happens. We're on a podcast. It's on the internet. Hey, we're in New York. We're going good, fellas. Oh, I'd like to hear it. Can we can we let him tell it? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll make it real quick. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's hand off the mic. So we are. So this is so Brian Roy Haas talking about Michael Pierce Dillon. So so I I grew up as a classical musician and uh-huh. I was like kind of a mediocre Midwestern prodigy at best. But what you know, state? In particular? I grew up in Oklahoma. Oh wow, that so, is a fucking crazy state. I've driven through it. And I was yeah, like, who lives here? It's it is a crazy fucking state. But I was I was practicing piano eight to twelve hours a day. Wow. And and this friend of mine comes up to me. He's like, dude. This guy is going to be at Eclipse at this punk rock club tonight. I don't know what style of music this is, but... Was it Billy Goat? It was. It okay. was it, it was a version of Billy Goat. No, it was Billy Goat. Yeah, it, it was, was Billy Goat. Yeah. So we're talking early to mid-90s. This was, this was 1990... No, because it was... Uh, Billy Goat broke up in 97. Yeah, so the year that I saw him was 1990. Oh, wow. At Eclipse, or 91, because oh, I was 19. Was yeah. Oh, no, oh, because it's 94, so I would have been 20. So you're right. It was 92. There we go. Yeah. Now we've got... Yeah, it, it was 92. It was 92. <laughs> if it was Eclipse, it was like 93, 94 times. Okay, it's 93. <laughs> because, 93. Because I was 19 case, years old. Let's just go with early 90s. So it's 1993. I'm 19 years old. I'm burned out on classical music. I walk into the club. He was about ready to commit homicide. We're, suicide or homicide or something. And so I, I, I walk into the club, and he's naked on stage taking a Timbali solo Really? Singing and rapping, he's buck ass naked yeah. in Oklahoma, which is a great way to go to jail. Yeah, and buck ass naked, I went right to the front of the stage, and and I just remember thinking, what I'm doing is irrelevant compared really? to what this man is doing. I'm just oh, practicing. Jim Bali's with your penis and go bleed at the fucking truck stop at the Loves after your gig at three in the morning. Did you get a lot of lizard to clean that up? No, dude. I remember one time I got naked and I was beating the shit out of the Tim Bali's with my dick, and I go and I'm. Pissing blood and looking at my dick, it's all fucking looks like a fucking orange. So that's problematic. It's all swollen up and fucked up. Yeah, that's... and I'm pissing blood. I'm like, whoa, I gotta stop doing this shit. Johnny, you never played a solo with your dick, dude. I do not. We've got. <laughs> <laughs> he says I do not play with my pecker. So, so, so that was my first time to see Mike Dean. It changed my life. I started Jacob Fred Jazz Odyssey just pool. a couple months late later. And what else did you start doing after we finally started really hanging out in 1999? I Mike Dillon, so I asked him because he was always showing me his dick. He was always showing me his dick, and I'm like, Mikey, why is your dick so big? And he's like, man, hey, hey, pal, all you got to do is pull on it all the time. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Oh, he's a about? stretcher. So, 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 so he's like, well, you take your left hand, you, you grab your balls, you pull it back, and you take your right hand, and you pull it out. So, oh, this is going to be so good. Come on, Johnny. So, so, so it's, it's called the Mike Dillon Pull and Tuck, and I've been doing the it for— tuck. The Mike Dillon Pull and Tuck. Oh! I've been, I've been doing it for 20 years, right? That's amazing. No, it's true. You know, uh, you know, I'm not only the president of the Mike Dillon Pull and Tuck Club. <laughs> I'm Dillon. a client, <laughs> and I have to say, when I started you're, you're off, self-employed. I had a three-inch pecker. <laughs> yeah, it's the weathering effect. If you stretch it enough, you'll get a big one. You just get it. Take a cold shower. You pull. You yank really hard. Yeah. And the next thing you know, you'll have a fucking eight-inch wonder. Yeah. With your left hand. With your left hand, you take your balls. You pull it back towards your taint. And with your right hand, right. You stretch grab the, balls, the shaft. Stick your balls into your own asshole, yeah. and then you really got it. Going. Right. Right. So with your left hand, you put your balls in your Best asshole. Best drum interview ever, right? <laughs> and and with the right hand, and with the right hand. Is this for a modern drummer? Yeah. And, and with the right hand. Yep, going right to moderndrummer.com. And with the right hand. <laughs> going to hustler.com. No, no, there's a definite technique, and I can show it to you guys if you want. It no, works. No, we don't. We're not shooting video. It won't make Grab sense. Grab the technique, mates. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, that was amazing. Um so ultimately, I love it that he, what he said that was that you seeing you live changed his life. But ultimately, it was about how to manipulate his own penis. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I did stop playing classical music right after that and start a band that took me yeah. all over the world. He's he's really my greatest inspiration. That's amazing. See, there you go. Mike. We that's Look what I'm saying. You. We talk a lot of fun, talk a lot of shit, but we have fun. We practice hard. We play hard. We live hard. Peace out. We got to drive. All right, thanks to Mike Dillon, Brian Haas, Johnny Vidakovich for the entertaining, albeit incredibly short interview. Uh, Mike, we got to do another, my man. Another 20-minute insane rant will do just fine if you ask me. Once again, be sure to catch Mike Dillon coming to a town near you and tell him Crash Bang Boom sent you. You'll find all that info on his website, MikeDillonVibes.com, in the description. Dude is a maniac, and in the best way possible, of course. We'll catch you on the next one. Crash Bang Boom! Boom.